notice that my last name is Mann, in case there's any kind of challenges or puzzles going around here today. Uh, that's my contact information. I think I repeated it at the end, if at the end of my talk you for any reason want to get in touch with me. Um, why am I here? Because uh, I've been doing this longer than Chris has. The B-Sides Nova 2019 presentation will begin momentarily. I have less hair than most people. I should put up the picture of what I used to look like, but uh, I've been in the business. I, I go back, it depends where I claim the beginning of my uh, InfoSec career. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I got into kind of phone freaking a little bit, which was the 70s. Uh, but like officially getting paid, uh, I go back to 1980. The B-Sides Nova 2019 so presentation years. will begin um, momentarily. Spent a little bit of time at NSA, which is why most people like to come hear me talk. Um, I did that thing in the middle there that's kind of green and yellow, but I don't want to say it because I don't know if anybody has anything for me. Um, recently uh, was published in a book called Tribe of Hackers, if anybody has a copy. Um, be happy to sign it if you have a copy. The B-Sides Nova um, 2019 and Marcus, the guy who put that book together, he said yesterday, I think, on Twitter, and I agree with him, we're all part of a tribe. Uh, whether you're in the book or not, I, I can think of, there's 70 people in that book, I can probably think of three times that many people that could easily have been in that book before me. Because uh, there's a lot of us out here that have a lot of good ideas and good things to say and good experiences. So to, to echo what Chris said, I'm here to, because I've been in the business a long time, I'm here to teach. I'm here to try to, to explain to you things that I've learned, hopefully so you don't make some of the same mistakes, because uh, we seem to have that problem in this industry, right Chris? I'll try to tie in my talk to your talk as much as possible. Um, just a word for my sponsor, I work for a company called Online Business Systems. We're a fairly small company, but we do security consulting which I would say is one of the w things that's different from the vendor side of this industry, because we are people that go out and actually try to teach and talk and explain to companies about how they need to do security, how they need to f do what they need to do, whether it's for a regulatory compliance requirement, like that three letter thing earlier, or whatever their reasons are, we try to help them out and we're growing like crazy and we are hiring, so hit me up if, if, if you're interested. I don't know what openings we have right now, but we are hiring. Um, so why, why talk about codes and secret writings from ancient times at a hacker conference? When uh, the organizers first came and toured this place back in, I think it was November, uh, we were all you know, very impressed with the facility and we all started making jokes about, hey, where are all the secret tunnels, which there probably are secret tunnels, but we're not allowed to look for them. Um, and uh, you know, we started making the Nicolas Cage national treasure jokes, but I think it boils down to, uh, oh, a disclaimer by the way. Uh, I'm giving a talk about encryption in colonial times and that's not when I was at NSA, just for the record. Okay, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Um, but I thought the, the, the reason really that I thought to give this talk is because there might be something in here that we can find. Um, so, I walked around here when we were doing the tour and I saw lots of interesting things uh, and I thought, well, you know, there was cryptography and secret writings and codes back in the revolution times. George Washington might have been a little bit involved with it. Why don't I give a talk on that? Um, I regret that now because this is a talk that I actually had to do research on. And I will apologize ahead of time. I am not an expert on this topic. I feel like I'm giving a high school book report, really. This is my thesis term paper or something. So I'm gonna, just gonna try to touch on some things, hopefully pique your interest, because there, there actually is a lot of really cool information out there about this stuff that I would argue, Chris, is infosec that goes back hundreds and, and even thousands of years. Um, the, the, the one thing I would qualify from what Chris was saying, uh, there's a lot of belief in this industry that InfoSec kind of started when computers started networking and the internet came about. InfoSec, depending on how you defined it, information, data security, keeping secrets, it's been around for thousands of years. Um, but let's jump into it. And again, I'm just going to try to go through at a high level uh, some of the things that went on back around the 
the founding of our country because you know this whole place is dedicated to George Washington Freemasonry does anybody know anything about Freemasonry here a little bit good I, I know next to nothing so again I'm just introducing ideas and uh, it's a super secret organization and so whatever you find out about it you can't say whether it's the truth or not because if you do they kick you out of the club or something um, Spies and espionage during the American Revolution, very important. Um, everybody's heard of this guy probably, Benedict Arnold. Usually if you refer to somebody as a traitor or you know, in our history, if you refer to somebody as a traitor, very often you refer to them as Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was a general in the Colonial Army, the Continental Army. So he was actually a war hero fighting for our side, for, uh, you know, we were rebels until we won the war, um, the American side. And at some point, he got sort of fed up for, and there's lots of arguments. One of the things I learned about this talk is there's a lot of uh, conjecture about motivations and why people did things. And uh, uh, you can do the research and, and make your own conclusions. I try not to pick a side. I, I try not to, to focus in on any one thing because I was doing this term paper and I had to get it done. Um, so I offer the information and you guys be the judge. But at some point he decided to go back over to the side of the British, which technically that's what he was at the beginning before he joined the rebel army, which was the Continental Army and so on and so forth. Um, he got wind at some point that the Americans were after him and knew that he was basically committing treason or committing espionage and he was able to escape to the British, went to England, lived a happy life. The guy that his, and I'll put it kind of in NSA, modern, more modern terms, the guy that was his handler, the guy that his, was his liaison, liaison on the side of the British, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't so lucky. He was captured by the Continental Army and uh, summarily executed. Which I mentioned for, uh, well, I'll, let me go to the next slide and then I'll mention why I'm mentioning these things. Here's another guy, famous spy uh, from the Revolutionary War times, Nathan Hale. Uh, if you're a kid in school, maybe you've heard this quote, I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Put that in InfoSec terms. How many of us work at a job where if we screw up, we're facing the gallows? Not too many of us, hopefully. Uh, might consider career choice changes if that were the case. But if, you know, I'm trying to tie all this ancient history into something that's relevant to us. And if there's one thing, and, and also to dovetail on what Chris was saying in terms of sort of changing the conversation, what I would say, my spin on that is the conversation's been going on for hundreds of years. The, the organizations and groups that focused on this thing that we call security or safety, uh, primarily in the past has been the military, and it's pr primarily been in terms of warfare and keeping secrets and espionage. And the risk equation back then uh, had to do with whether you were going to live or die, uh, whether it was you personally or the freedom of your country that you're fighting for and so on and so forth. In today's modern terms, in the context of what we're talking about, the risk is, I would submit to you, one of two things. You, either you're working for an organization or uh, your customers an organization, if they're commercial, it's a little bit different if you're government, and the government's uh, probably very well represented here today. But in the commercial world, I, I submit to you that there's basically, basically one of two risks when you boil it down. Your ability to make money and how much it's going to cost you to make money. Um, lots of variations, but I think they more or less all roll up into one of those two things. So the monetary economic as aspect of this thing that we call risk compared to who's done it over hundreds of years, particularly in this country, where the risk has really been our life and our livelihoods, our freedoms, our liberties. I just, I share that to suggest to you maybe part of this conversation that Chris wants us to have is, what? I need to speak louder? Oh my gosh. Maybe I should put the microphone on that side. Is that better? I'm recorded better? Okay. Um, lost my train of thought. Uh, the, the conversation about risk, the conversation about doing something different, 
Uh, I would submit to you that we need to go back in time a little bit further than the beginnings of the internet and figure out these things that we call risk and figure out a way to apply them into our modern context before we start talking about all the fun gee whiz technology and all the things that are broken as, as Chris was talking about. Uh, I agree with what he's saying. I, I'm just, because I'm older than him, I take a step further back perhaps. Fair? Um, Here's a question for you. Does anybody know who Agent 711 is or was in the context of the American Revolution? Might be one of the people up there on the screen. Anybody see up people up there they recognize? Shout it out. I mean, like the names of the people that you recognize. Paul Revere's up there, yep. Ben Franklin, George Washington. Uh, guy on the bottom left is uh, Benedict Arnold. Anybody know who the woman is up on the top right? That's a good guess. Uh, we'll get to her in a minute. Um, so there's this war going on, this revolution, and uh, it was our country fighting against our, our country, which was, you know, we were a British colony. And, um, uh, and again, I'm not an expert on the Revolutionary War, but uh, the Brits, for very early on in the conflict, kind of took over New York City. And, uh, you know, that's, that was sort of their base of operations at some portion of the war. That's where most of their forces were, the command headquarters and, and whatnot. And so there was a need or there was a desire from the Continental Army, headed by George Washington, General Washington, to get information. So there were spies in New York City. And they created a network, uh, it was actually called the Culper Spy Ring. And again, not an expert, I'm just kind of giving you bits and pieces and tidbits of this thing. Um, but they were organized primarily to spy on the British that were occupying New York City. And uh, it was uh, head, headed up by a guy named Benjamin Talmadge. I don't know if I pronounced that name correctly. And uh, Colonial Map of the Times. New York City, if you're familiar with your geography, is sort of, you know, down at the bottom towards this, that big island called Long Island, and across the bay is Connecticut. And uh, that lady in the picture is a woman named Anna Strong. She had a very important role in the Culper spy ring. Uh, and she operated very successfully, primarily because back in those days, women were considered non-combatants, so they weren't really Surprise, surprise, nobody really paid attention to them. You know, the wars were fought by gentlemen and, and men, and the women were just there to cook and clean and, and you know, whatever, what other services might be required or desired. Um, what she did was, and it's an interesting map that I found, um, you know, you have New York, New York City down in the quarter, I should use my laser pointer, there we go. You know, British are here, people would spy on them, find out what their strengths were, troop strengths were, if they seemed like they were planning to, you know, go anywhere and fight any battles, what their defenses were. And somebody would ride from there up to up Long Island towards this point where there was a guy running a ferry. And, and Anna Strong's job was to hang out the laundry, laundry and she would hang a black petticoat that was a signal that hey, the guy with information is coming, you on the other side of the shore should bring your boat over and pick them up to bring them back to take the message on. Imagine how long that took. I don't know if you know this geography at all, but you know, these are people probably traveling on horseback. You know, they get this information, they gotta do this long circuitous route, which actually with today's traffic, and I think there is a ferry that runs over there, would take hours, but imagine this probably took days and weeks. So you know, the information flow was probably days, weeks, months, just to find out what was going on. I find that fascinating, just especially in, in, in our techn technologically wired, everything happens in an instant world. Um, but this Culper, Culper spy ring in this area, and there were several members of it, and, and one of the key members was this woman named Anna Strong. Um, they needed to talk, obviously. They needed to communicate, so they started to deploy uh, different types of ways, uh, and this is where we get into cryptography, which is uh, what I used to do at NSA. So they, game, they came up with some various systems of codes and ciphers. Anybody know, want to shout out, 
what the difference is between a code and a cipher, at least in a classical sense? Anybody want to wager a guess? The code has the information in it, the cipher, it's an interesting good guess. Uh, Cypher is trying to hide the information. Code is representing it in a different way. That's a pretty good, pretty good definition. Um, it's sort of obsolete these days because these terms in terms of computing and technology uh, are, are very often used interchangeably. Um, let's look at these and, and we'll try to, 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 to show you examples of, of how they're different. Um, the best way that I try to remember it is codes tend to take words and ideas and phrases and convert it into some sort of shorthand, uh, something that's shorter than the whole, uh, and hopefully secret so you don't know what it means. Um, anybody familiar with the Navajo cold, uh, code talkers from World War II? Um, they used a system of code. In, in their conversation. Uh, they were, I'm jumping to World War II, sorry. Still before my time, by the way, <laughs> I didn't say. Um, but they were speaking in their native dialect, which was, you know, and apparently the Japanese had difficulty understanding the dialect, but they also used codes. Uh, off the top of my head, you know, a tank might have been, they, they used their word buffalo. So, you know, we're gonna move 100 buffalo from point A to point B. So they had a series of words that were words from their native language that were things that they were familiar with. And so they were able to confuse the Japanese, A, by using their dialect, with which, which the Japanese didn't know, and B, using a series of codes. Um, really simple example of codes in the Revolutionary War times, and you probably are familiar with this, is uh, if you know the poem by uh, Longfellow, uh, listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. The signal was put in the church tower, which could be seen at a great distance, one if by land, two if by sea. One lantern lit meant one thing, two lanterns lit meant another thing, a phrase, an idea, simplified into a code. Um, numerous examples, one I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit about, I uh, believe this was the one used by the Culper spy ring. Um, they basically had a, a, a book, or a booklet, if you will, three, four, five pages, and it's probably, it, well, it's old for one thing, it's hard to tell, but they basically had a, a lexicon, a dictionary of words that meant something to them. Uh, geographical directions, places, names, uh, things that soldiers might do, terminology that had stuff to do with the military and troop movement and fighting battles and things like that and they had a numerical representation for it. In modern world, in the modern world with the three letter thing that I'm not gonna say, because unless somebody's brought me a drink yet, um, um, it's becoming very common to do credit cards, convert them to what they call tokens, where the token is a representation of the credit card number, but it's not the credit card number. It's supposed to be super secret, yada, yada, yada. But back in those days, it was just simply a list of words that they assigned a number to. So, who was Agent 711? Every member of the Culper spy ring had a, a, a number assigned to him. And uh, 711, turns out, was George Washington. I thought it was cool. So, codes were, again, words, ideas, phrases, maybe places that were replaced in this instance by three digits, or yeah, I think they're all three digits. That's a code. Ciphers, on the other hand, uh, I think a lot of us are probably more familiar with a, a classic cipher, which is, and the easiest way for me to understand it or remember it is, it's more or less a, a, a letter for letter substitution or hiding or representation, rather than words and ideas and phrases. So. Uh, there was a guy named Benjamin Church back in those days. He was actually on the side of the British. He was a British spy. This is a, a sample of a, a, a document that still exists today, uh, and it's really hard to make out, but uh, he was basically doing simple substitution. H anybody ever hear of a Caesar cipher? 
where you just take the alphabet and you, you jumble it some way, slide it to some offset. This is similar, uh, but what he did was, which he thought was going to be more clever and harder to break if you were trying to intercept it and read it, was he used symbols as well as letters to represent the different letters. Unfortunately, once you figure out what you're looking at, you can, and this is getting a little bit into the cryptography of it, um, you, you can figure out what the frequencies of letters are and, and still kind of break it. You know, it all boils down to a simple substitution. Um, I have this an example. You know, this is the preamble to the Constitution. I found this cool little program on the internet where it does the, uh, a frequency count of all the letters. You, you, you drop in whatever you want, a, a paragraph or a sentence, and it'll count up the letters for you. So this is sort of a, more or less a standard represent, representation of the frequency of letters in the English language. Uh, back in my NSA days, we learned this kind of stuff, more or less from a historical perspective. But uh, we memorized what was called the Etnorias letters, or the Senorita letters, S-E-N-O-R-I-T-A. Those are the most common letters in the English language. Etnorias just happens to be in, in order. So the most common letter in the English language is E. Make sense? We, the people of the United States. A lot of E's up there just in the very beginning. So if you jumble it, though, and you've got different letters or symbols representing what's the real letter, you can still take account of them, and while the, the distribution is different, if you look at this, you know, what, if you were just going to take a guess, what letter do you think is the letter E, just based on those frequency counts? Why? Yep, it kind of sticks out there. You put up, you know, just the first couple words there, there's a lot of E's there. Two-letter word ending in E, there's only so many of them three-letter word ending in E. There's only so many of them. And you can start to guess and figure it out. Uh, but that's sort of an example of uh, how you, as a cryptographer or cryptanalyst, would break a, uh, uh, what's technically called monoalphabetic, or we, we know it as a Caesar, it's a simple substitution, which is what essentially what that guy Benjamin Church was using. And uh, it, his messages were read, is, is the bottom line. Uh, something else that was used, uh, which I thought was kind of cool, uh, was invisible ink, ink, what they called secret writings. Um, and most of you have seen the movie National Treasure? Okay. So if you recall in the National Treasure, uh, there's a hidden message on the back of the Declaration of Independence. In this scene, they're, they've stolen it, and they're trying to uh, figure out if there's a message there, and they start by rubbing lemon juice on the back of the document. What's interesting about that is lemon juice is actually something that was used as invisible ink. They would write in lemon juice and it would disappear, and they would use some other chemical agent to make it reappear. So effectively in the movie, they would have been erasing whatever secret message or masking whatever secret message was there. So don't believe everything you see in the movies. Um, this is an example uh, of an actual document where you can see some of the lines are a little bit darker. Uh, what they would do is they would write a message, they would write a letter, and in, the, in, in between lines is where they would write their invisible message, which, you know, this was converted and, and uh, you know, preserved, but the hidden message is the dark lines, and don't ask me what it says, but it's very important and it, help us, it helped us win the war. Um, this was got written by a guy named, uh, I do have some notes, Benjamin Thompson, for what it's worth. And, uh, you know, basically they had, they came up with solutions that would, you could write your message, and as it dried, it would disappear. Uh-oh. I can say PCI now! Thank you, sir. Um, so they really used it, and uh, one, one agent would... How many had in, invisible ink when you were a kid, or you're still a kid and you've used it? It's the same basic principle. Um, and it's lots of fun and it worked if you didn't know it was there. If you did, it was pretty easy to figure out how to break it. Um, another scene from the movie National Treasure, you know, the, the glasses with the multicolored things to try to fi find the hidden message, the hidden map on the back of the declaration. Pretty sure that's movie fiction too. But what was written allegedly on the back of the declaration was a series of digits. 
And in the movie they called that, anybody remember from the movie what they called it? I do, because I did the research. And it's one of my favorite movies, because it's got crypto in it. They called it the Ottendorf Cipher. Um, the Ottendorf Cipher was made up. That's not really what they called it back in the day. Uh, and it was an example of what they call a book cipher. And essentially, the key to the message was some sort of document or book that, that both parties knew about and they, they both had copies. And you know, if you recall from the movie, uh, and I'm not gonna remember the exact details, the three digits were like the page, the line, and then the character moving across the row. And so there's a scene where the little kid's writing them down. The, the code or key in the movie was something called the silence do good letters. Uh, nobody thinks that they were ever actually used as a book cipher back in the day. Uh, I will also say it could be a book code if you simply said instead of a letter, just make it the whole word. That was something that was an option. Um, but again, uh, you would do a representation of page, line, letter, and you know whatever book was common. And books were hard to come by back then, and books were expensive, so only certain people had the books. And there's actually uh, ciphers that were written in the revolutionary times that have been preserved that nobody still to this day knows what the code, the, the key was, knows what book they used, so they have yet to be broken. If you want a challenge, uh, you could go after that. And technically what they called them instead of Ottendorf was Arnold cipher because this was the method that, ben, uh, that Benedict Arnold was using to communicate with that guy that got hanged because uh, he got caught. Another thing they did that was kind of clever was something that was called masked letters. Uh, very highly secure and also a source of disinformation. And so basically what they did was they wrote this big long letter that had all sorts of information. And uh, you know that's a, that's a transcription of, nobody can read that kind of stuff. It's cursive for one thing. Does anybody read cursive anymore? Does anybody write cursive? Young people, are you taught cursive in school anymore? There you go. That's about all I do is my, is my name. That's all any of us do. Um, so what they, you know, they would send this letter and it seems like it's a reasonable letter and it's some kind of weird message, maybe a little bit. But uh, the, the key to, in this case was that they had this stencil with a, with, that had a hole cut out of the paper that would lay on top of the actual letter and the words that were in, in the opening was the real message. So, you know, go back, you know, that's the whole letter, that's the highlighted area of the real words, and that's the real message. Um, you know, and all those words are somewhere in there, not necessarily lined up the same because, you know, Microsoft likes to do page and carriage returns and stuff like that. But the message is there. And if you didn't have the stencil, you never really knew exactly what were the words that mattered or not. Uh, a secondary benefit of this was that this was also a form of misinformation. Somebody might get the letter and thinking, oh, it says something, let's act upon it, but the message inside says something different. Um, how am I doing on time? Not too bad. Uh, I'm going to summarize a couple of the other things I saw, A, because I ran out of time, and B, you know, we could go on for days and days because there was a lot of stuff there, again, piquing your interest. Uh, one of their methods of communications was simply they would write messages out on long strips of, uh, of paper and they write them like maybe in the, in the, in the um, what's the thing where you put your sword in? Yeah, thank you, that thing. Uh, or inside the quill of a pen, they'd roll it up and slide it up in, the, in you know, the opening of a quill, which is what they used for pens back in those days. So no encryption here, or they could do it encrypted, um, but it was, you know, the, the idea was that you try to hide it so uh, you, get, you, you, know, you don't get caught with something that obviously means you're spying. Which brings us back to Nathan Hale, uh, the guy that said, I regret that I have but one life to live for my country. He was caught uh, with documents that showed like the, 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 uh, the defensive positions that the British had laid out in New York City. It was written on paper and it was stuffed in his shoe. 
and, and when you have that kind of information on you in colonial times during war, they assume you're a spy and you get to be hanged, you're executed. So it was also important not only to encrypt the message, Somebody turned. And it went away. Um, Weird. I'm good? OK. Um, this is something also that I learned in my NSA times. We called it methods and sources, where not only is the information important to protect, but also how you're getting the information. Uh, what, make, what made and makes things top secret and super top, top secret in today's world very often is not the actual content of the data, it's how you got the data. You know, think for example if there's an adversary and there's, uh, you know, the president of a country talking to his general about making plans to attack something and they the two of them and maybe a couple of their aides were in a conference room in an office having this discussion, but more or less there's only like maybe four people in the world that th know that they were talking about. Maybe the room was bugged. Maybe one of the people in the room is a spy, a double agent that, that's you know, bringing the information back to the other side. You know, any number of things could be how you got that information. But if you find le out later on that that conversation that was had with four people was known by the other side, you've only got so many options. So uh, if you think it's a bug, you're going to sweep the room and find the bug and eliminate it. So if you're the other side and you've spent millions of dollars and people trying to find the right opportunity to get bu the bug in the room and you're getting all sorts of great information, you don't really want them to find out that there's a bug in the room. Also, if you've recruited some, somebody that's in the room and they're a spy and they're spying for you, you kind of don't want to lose that as a source of information. So it's very important to protect it. Methods, like a bug, sources, like a spy. Uh, so, and this goes back hundreds of years. Um, what's the other thing? Intercepted letters, that's again, that's the, the disinformation. Sending out a message that says something that's meaningless or intended to distract or misdirect the opposition. You want them to find the letter. You want them to steal it and read it and go off somewhere else where you're gonna be over here. Um, they didn't have uh, necessarily reliable forms of exchanging data back in those days, so very often the way they did it was something called a dead drop, where they'd, they would have a place somewhere usually out in the country, maybe the hollow of a tree, maybe a certain rock in a certain field, and you know one person would go out and put the message in a little hiding place, and then the person who was the intended recipient would know to go out there every once in a while and check for it, or at a appointed time, they would go out and receive it. And, and again, that was a way to sort of protect the communication path, the method, the sources. Um, if you go to the gift shop today, that little cipher wheel thingy that looks kind of interesting, uh, it's available for sale. Uh, you can get a little replica of that. This was actually designed by Thomas Jefferson sometime during the war. Uh, but it was to everybody, you know, I will say from what I read, uh, everybody believes that they didn't actually ever build it and use it during the, the, the revolution. They might have built it later and used it for like diplomatic communications. So I think Jefferson became diplomat to where France or something like that. Again, I apologize. I don't know my American history as well as I should. Um, but it's kind of cool because you would, it has a series of wheels and you, and each wheel has basically the alphabet in just sort of some random order. You write out the message you want, and then you pick any other line. You know, it would make sense maybe the one above or below, and you write down the random letters, and then you've encrypted or encoded your message, encrypted. See, I do it, I, I mess up myself. Uh, the person on the other end has the same wheel, and the wheels are in the same order, and they line up the gobbledygook, and they know to look for the real message. Uh, pretty basic concept, but not technically from the American Revolution. Um, Shifting gears a little bit because we are in the uh, Temple of the Freemasons, and again, caveat, I am not an expert on Freemasonry. It's a super secret society, uh, and there's lots of theories and debates about what it's all about because it's a secret of society. So I just want to just introduce a few things because Freemasonry certainly has had an influence on the, on the founding of this country. Um, 
and I'll just share some of that with you, share a little bit of uh, what you can get out of the symbols that you'll, you know, pay attention as you're walking around here today. There's all sorts of display cases with all sorts of weird stuff. And stop and take a look at some of this stuff. There's different uh, artifacts, there's different pictures and whatnot, and, and look for some of these things that I'm gonna share with you. Um, but you know, just real briefly, anybody have any idea how many Masons were signers of the Declaration of Independence? Ball, you know, anybody take a guess? I mean, how many people know how many people signed the Declaration? I don't, but I have the answer before me. <laughs> That's a pretty good guess. They think eight, maybe nine. There's one person that they're not sure of out of 56 signers. And uh, the Constitution, they say 13 out of 39. I found it interesting that there's fewer people that signed the Constitution than the Declaration. I want to know why. I didn't have time to research it, but I'm kind of curious about it. How many presidents? We've got 44 or 45, depending on your political persuasion right now. <laughs> How many of those presidents uh, do you think have been Masons throughout history? 15? It's a really good guess. Very close, 14. I think the most recent president that it was a Freemason, uh, I could have written down the, the names of all of them, but I figured that's something you guys can Google. I, I want to say Gerald Ford was the last one that was a Mason. Was it Clinton? I'll take your word for it. Who knows? Um, this is probably the most common symbol in Freemasonry, um, and you'll see it all around here. If I could focus on all these signs, I mean, it's probably in the room somewhere if you look hard enough. But uh, these, are, these are carpenter's tools. Freemasons were builders. Uh, and so a lot of the, the imagery and the symbols had to do with you know, things that they did as their trades, their craftsmen. They were builders. They were the architects. They were de the designers. Uh, what I read into that, and this is just my own opinion, is they were the smart people. They were the ones that were more likely educated and knew all the math and everything. Is it a stretch to say they were the hackers of their day? I don't know. But uh, they use symbols. I, I, one thing I got out of this, and again, this is my opinion, is a lot of people back in you know, 200 years ago uh, didn't learn to read and write. There was a lot of illiteracy. And it wasn't intentional. It was just you didn't need to learn it. And it was usually people that were more affluent that had the opportunity to be educated. And they ended up being the people in power and all that. But to communicate messages to people that don't read, I think very often uh, they revert to symbols. I mean, this is done in, in all sorts of walks of life, but Freemasonry included. So using symbols that would be representations of things that were in people's lives that they would make a connection and understand. So a square and compass, this is the universal symbol. And I read different things like, you know, a compass is used to make a circle. The square is used to make, surprise, a square, and these are like ancient symbols of the universe or, or you know, the heavens and earth, and they're connected somehow. Um, I went with it, that sounds interesting. That big G, you're gonna see probably the G around, especially if you go to the other track. I don't know, when we were here touring, they, they, they have this G on a pedestal, and it was kind of up on the stage, and it, it you know, some people stand, think it stands for God, some people think it stands for the guardian, um, the, what, I, what I got most, mostly was they refer to the grand arch, architect of the universe, which was sort of a generic term because Freemasonry is supposed to be receptive of different types of religions, different types of gods, whatever you call your god, grand architect, their builders, their designers. So leave that where it is. Uh, especially if you go over to the other uh, track, you, you might see the pillars. Um, they actually have names, and it actually goes back to the building of Solomon's temple, and there's a, a, a scripture verse in, I think, second, first or second Samuel or something like that, that actually says when you build the temple and you build these pillars, give them the names of Boaz, and I don't know how you say that, Yaquin, Jaquin, probably Yaquin. Um, so there's some history there. There's a tie-in to Solomon's temple or the porch of Solomon's temple. And, uh, you know, this is something that you see in the Freemasonry symbols. There's tie in to the ancient religions. There's tie, ties to, to various things, symbols that you look out for. Um, 
you know, George Washington's around here everywhere. There's statues like at every corner of George Washington. I think in one of the display cases somewhere around here, one or more, you know, you'll, you see these aprons. If you see the Freemasons dressed up, if there's photographs of them, you know, the aprons, you know, they're builders, they're architects. It's, it's their tool belt essentially, but it's also become ceremonial. When I was reading about it and learning about it, and again, I'm not an expert, I could be wrong, but it, it kind of reminded me of, of uh, the martial arts. When you, when you become a, a beginner, they give you a white belt. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the, the degrees of the belts, all the different colors, uh, in, in, you know, the way it used to be traditionally is you were given a white belt, and over time, you never washed it. As you advanced your learning and your education over time, the thing just got dirty and would just, you know, it would go from white to green to purple to whatever. And a black belt, black belt simply means it's filthy, dirty, and disgusting, and probably mildew, mildewed and moldy. But it's, it, it represents that you're a master. So I kind of, I, I read into this thing. You're, you're given an apron when you start in the Freemasonry, and you you go through all the different degrees and learn more and get more, and you you get like better aprons over time and stuff added to it. That's what it reminded me of. Anybody got a dollar bill in the back of their wallet, purse, wherever you? Well, most people don't carry cash anymore. Children, there's this thing that we used to have called currency, <laughs> money. Um, <laughs> it's really funny that some of this stuff goes away. But if you've ever seen a dollar bill, on the back of it, you see this uh, symbol, and, and you got this little hairy eyeball. And as best as I can tell, they call it the eye of providence, and it basically means you know, God is watching you at all times, or the grand architect of the universe. So be mindful of what you do, be conscious of your behaviors and your actions, because there's this all-seeing force that's watching you. Kind of like Big Brother, maybe. Kind of like Google is these days, but whatever. Um, beehive, you should see beehives around here. I don't think this is a stretch. Um, you know, if you think of a beehive, you think of, you know, all these bees working together for a purpose. It, it's, it's a complex structure and you know, busy as a bee. Uh, I, you know, I believe they use this symbol to represent, hey, we're all together as a unit, our Masonic body. We're all working together for one purpose. We have this higher cause. We're, we're complex and organized and so forth. Um, you'll see the skull and crossbones. Hey, guess what? It means death. Or uh, I saw references to a Latin phrase memento mori, uh, which roughly translates to, you know, remember you're going to die. You know, so just be conscious of what you do again. A, a lot of these symbols, I think, were representations because you couldn't give people a book to read because they didn't necessarily read, but they were taught these symbols represent the way you're supposed to behave, the way you're supposed to represent yourself, the way you're supposed to interact with others. Um, You'll probably, probably see pictures, I don't know specifically what ones are around here, but look for it. Uh, pictures of George Washington in his garb with his apron holding a trowel. And it sounds a little geeky, but uh, you know, the trowel is like how you spread you know, cement to bind all the bricks together. So it's, it's meant to represent how they're spreading, uh, you know, what did they say, goodwill and character, love and affection. You know, it, it's, it, you, you as a mason are supposed to spread goodwill and cheer to others, that type of thing. Um, oh, and this is the important part of this talk. If anybody is you know, playing along at home or maybe participating in the challenges, um, throughout history, very often masons get buried and they put these weird messages on the tombstones. If you'll see up here, there's some weird characters and you see these weird characters here, and you see these weird characters here. So they like to do encryption too, and they have, they have a form of cryptography. Again, it's a simple substitution system, and it's commonly referred to as the pig pen cipher, where they just take you know, tic-tac-toe squares and diagonals, and they fill in the spaces with the letters of the alphabet, and so instead of writing the letter, they simply write the shape that represents the, the, the quadrant or the, the area where the letter plays. So just a brief example of, of how it works. So I throw that in there because to tie it all together, there was cryptography not only in the American Revolution, but with the Freemasons, and they had this thing called the pink pen cipher. Um, term paper, I, you know, I needed a bibli bibliography this time. 
Uh, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the National Cryptologic Museum, which is up at, at uh, Fort Meade, NSA, which is where I used to work. Um, they actually have a pretty cool section on uh, cryptography in the American Revolution, a lot of the stuff I talked about. If you have a chance, head up to Fort Meade. It's probably about an hour away from here. Uh, you know, open most days, and it's, a really, and it's free to go into. Um, another place that I found, and th this is actually really cool, and I want to look into it more. A lot of the pictures of letters that I showed in this talk are actually held in, in a library, um, the Clement Library, which is at the University of Michigan. They have a lot of these documents that they've preserved, and it looks like they have a really large collection. I just showed you a few. They've got a lot of really cool documents. And um, also Mount Vernon, which is only a few miles down the road, which again, if you have time to visit, you should check it out. But their website's just full of information. They have a whole section on uh, spies and secret writings and everything. So a lot, of the, a lot of what I was telling you about came from there. So bibliography, acknowledgement, I, I, none of this is original. I got it mostly from these sources. Um, and just for some fun, if you do happen to go down to Mount Vernon, only about a mile away from here is uh, one of the boundary st stones that were laid out when the, the District of Columbia was originally laid out. Um, the very first stone that was set, which was, there, they put stones every mile through the 10, 10 mile square uh, that was the District of Columbia. The very first one was placed just about a mile or so from here at Jones Point. There's a lighthouse there now, you, and if you go down there, look for that building, and around the back towards the water's edge is this little glass case uh, because the geography has shifted over the last couple hundred years, and so now they have to preserve it. But that's the very first stone that was laid out to lay out DC. Is it? I have it on the bucket list to go find. You know, most of them, that whole website, go back. There's a website there that has what happened to all of them and where they are. Most of them still exist, like 38 or 39 of them still exist. Some of them have been moved you know, because buildings or parking lots were put in. But uh, one of these days, I'm going to go out and try to find them all. Who's with me? Um, not today, though. I uh, think we're doing pretty good on time. Five minutes. Any questions, comments? What does this all mean in today's world? Pontificate, anything. I probably can't answer the questions about this stuff because I'm not an expert. Anything? Questions, comments? Yes? Uh-huh. Mm. Interesting. I did not know that. Thank you for sharing. Why does it make a difference to write stuff down if you're trying to break it? Hmm. Makes it harder to count things. Harder to see the patterns. And they probably didn't have really cool digital audio recording equipment back in World War II. I'm sorry? Also in the Nicolas Cage movie, that's right. Everything I learned about cryptography, I learned from Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Thank you for indulging me. This, is, this was outside of my comfort zone, but I had fun. And um, oh, I should mention, the Cryptologic Museum, they have a booklet that talks about this stuff. It's free if you go to visit, and the museum's free. And if you get a chance, go out and get your own copy of Tribe of Hackers. <laughs> <laughs>